to uh, to rejoice and God wants us to rejoice in uh, in Him. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to uh, to do it. The other one is uh, uh, it's helpful in our walk with God when we stop and think of some of the different uh, aspects of, uh, of Philippians, what uh, what Paul talks about, and we're all familiar with. Uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, and if we were doing this at the church, uh, at this point in time, we would all sing together, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice, but, you know, since we're not there, and I can't, won't be able to hear you singing because you're all muted, and I don't want to sing a solo myself, we'll just skip that part and move on. Uh, maybe next Sunday, we'll, uh, we'll do that just for, uh, just for fun. So, uh, looking at the book of Philippians, and we're going to do that for the next uh, several weeks, however long that uh, the Lord allows us to be here and sharing. The uh, International Standard Version uh, Study Bible has uh, uh, four different reasons why uh, Paul wrote the book of Philippians. The first one was he wrote it because uh, uh, he wanted the Philippians to know how he was doing about his well-being because they knew that at the time that he was uh, in either house arrest or imprisoned in, uh, in Rome, uh, he was waiting to, uh, to meet the emperor and to give his account of uh, uh, the things that he has, uh, he has done uh, because he was a, a Roman citizen. And so he was there. Uh, most folks think it was written around uh, 62 uh, AD is whenever uh, the apostle Paul wrote the, the book. And <clears throat> if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, Paul, not Paul the apostle, but Paul Parent uh, preached a message on uh, the beginning of the book that Paul was probably about 57 years old at, uh, at this point in time. So uh, thinking about that, he was just a little bit younger than, uh, than the Lord Jesus whenever he was here on this earth. So uh, Paul writing the, the book, he wanted to, the Philippians to know about his well-being. Uh, he wanted the Philippians to know about Epaphroditus, how Epaphroditus was doing, because we'll get into chapter two and we'll talk about Epaphroditus and how he was sick and, and how uh, the Lord used him and what a you know, godly man he was and the things that uh, God had done for, uh, for him. Third reason, is he wanted them to uh, he wanted to thank them for the gift that they had sent to him, and so apparently when you get back to the chapter four, uh, he talks about the gift that uh, the believers in Philippi sent to uh, Paul. Uh, we don't know what the gift was, whether it was foodstuffs, whether it was uh, money, what it, what exactly was that he sent to them. But uh, uh, Paul talks about how he met, uh, how they met his needs, how they met his necessities, and so uh, Paul was content in uh, in those things and thankful to them for uh, giving him this uh, this gift. And so he. Uh, uh, was thankful to them, and so he wanted to write them a, uh, a thank you letter to uh, to do that. And then the last reason he wanted to uh, to write, and this is what again the uh, study Bible ESV study Bible says, the last reason was he wanted to encourage them in the faith. And so uh, as I think about this, you know, we really don't uh, uh, we really already know uh, how Paul was doing, right? He's in heaven. He's doing real well. We already know how Epaphroditus is doing. He's in heaven. He's uh, he's doing real uh, real well. Uh, we're not too interested in the gift, but the fourth reason he wanted to encourage them in their faith and their walk with God, and I think that's the uh, uh, the key that we want to get out of the the book of Philippians is we want to uh, be encouraged in our uh, in our faith, be encouraged in our in our walk with God, be strengthened as we go forward in our service for. Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, I would say, or I would like to say that uh, I think the theme of the, the book, sort of the whole, you know, reason for writing it, uh, sort of the, uh, the thread that weaves it all together is that uh, Paul wants us to rejoice in the Lord. And as uh, we talk about that, uh, we'll see uh, several different places where the Apostle Paul talks about rejoicing in the Lord and thankful to the Lord and, and uh, just mentions rejoice uh, probably a half a dozen times at least. And so uh, obviously it's something very important, not only for the Philippians, but for each one of us, because he tells, uh, talks about rejoicing in some uh, difficult things, not just when things are uh, going well and that whenever things are, are perfect. So uh, 
that being said, let's jump into uh, the background of the book of Philippians, and it all starts in Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bible open into uh, Acts chapter 16, uh, the Apostle Paul was uh, in the, the city of uh, Philippi, and he had a, a wonderful thing happen in the, in the, the city of Philippi, verses 14 and 15. Uh, talk about how Lydia gets saved. It says, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God, heard us, whose heart was uh, the Lord open, and she attended to the things which were spoken by Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained them. So the Apostle Paul was there, uh, Timothy was there, uh, they were preaching, the, uh, preaching the, the gospel to the people that were uh, in the, the city uh, where, they were, uh, where they were meeting. Uh, this uh, lady by the name of Lydia, the Lord opened her heart and she came to know Christ. And so she wanted Paul and his uh, followers to come and to uh, stay at, uh, at her house, which they did. And then after uh, that, uh, that's when things get exciting in, uh, in Philippi for the Apostle Paul. Verse 16 says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain maid possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And so apparently this, uh, this woman, uh, this young person, uh, a maid, uh, which would give us the indication she was probably a, a younger uh, woman who was unmarried, but she had a spirit of divination, probably a, a demon. She was, uh, she was demon possessed, but uh, the, the people who owned her as a, as a slave were getting lots of money, getting uh, uh, a good income because of her abilities to uh, uh, do uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, prophesying and, and telling fortunes and doing those kinds of, uh, doing those kinds of things. And so uh, uh, here was this woman, and it says in verse 17, and this she besought, and the same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, who show unto us the way of salvation. And so here she is making this proclamation, making this declaration that, uh, you know, Paul and the, the, father, the people that were with him, they were servants of the Most High God. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, here is somebody who would be demon-possessed who would make this proclamation about Paul, that he was servant of the, that they were the servants of the Most High God. And not only that, but they would show us, uh, declare unto us, preach unto us, the way of salvation, how to have everlasting, uh, everlasting life. In verse 18, and she said, and she did this many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out in that same hour. So this went on for, uh, for several days, and I don't know if you've ever stopped and wondered, oh, why, I wonder why Paul didn't do this. <laughs> In the beginning of uh, of her coming and giving this uh, this uh, explanation or this uh, declaration, why didn't he just uh, you know cast out the demon right away? Well, obviously that wasn't God's plan, and so finally Paul did, and at that same hour, this uh, this demon uh, possessed uh, this demon that was in this woman possessing her uh, came out, and she was uh, and the demon was gone. Now, verse 19 says, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And so obviously, just like uh, anyone else that uh, uh, were around or uh, in business circles, whenever they're... Uh, uh, cash cow or whenever their uh, means of making a living has been disturbed, has been uh, uh, put to, uh, to an end, has been stopped, uh, they get excited about it. And so what do they do? They come to the, uh, to the apostle, they take the apostle Paul, they take Silas, off they, uh, off they go to the magistrates and they make a declaration. You know, you know what these guys are doing? They're, they're ruining, they're destroying, they're uh, uh, messing up the things that we're doing. And they're, uh, they're Jews and they're uh, teaching the customs that are not lawful and they receive uh, uh, neither otherwise being, uh, being Romans. Verse 22 says, and the multitude rose up against them 
and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailers to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And so the, uh, the, <clears throat> the people of the city were so upset that they uh, ripped the clothes off of Paul and Silas and they beat them with, uh, with rods and uh, put them into the innermost part of the city. I mean, the innermost part of the jail. And that's where they, uh, they would stay. And so you, you know, you just think about, uh, you know, the apostle Paul and here he is, you know, preaching the gospel and trying to, uh, to get people to respond to the gospel and people trying, uh, you know, people getting saved and he, and he casts out this demon from this, uh, this woman and, uh, the people get so upset, they begin to, uh, to beat them and cast them into, uh, in the jail. And we certainly look at that and say, wow, that's certainly not fair. That's not the way things work out. But, you know, God had, you know, even bigger uh, plans for the Apostle Paul and uh, the things that were going to take place in the church at Philippi, especially in regard to the starting of the, of the church. Verse number 25, probably one of the most exciting uh, passages of scripture that you uh, that will ever read. And it says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang, praising unto God, and the prisoners heard them, okay? And again, uh, I like to compare myself to, uh, to that, little, uh, that little verse right there. Here are men who had been uh, beaten because of their service to, uh, to God. They had been cast into the prison. They had had their, you know, probably their arms and their feet put into the uh, stocks. And what are they doing? They're not uh, sitting there saying, oh, God, why did you, you know, why did you leave us? Why did you, uh, you know, why are you letting us into a situation like this? Why are you, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> rewarding us with, you know, this horrible things that are taking place? No, they're sitting there and they're praising and uh, singing and they prayed and sang praises unto God. You know, they're, you know, they're worshiping God in the midst of this, uh, this horrible situation. And so you can understand why the apostle Paul would say stuff like, as we read through the, as we'll read through the book of Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice because he was a, a living example of somebody who was rejoicing in the difficulties and struggles and trials that were going on in his, uh, in his life. And so, you know, he's magnifying this, but it's also interesting that it says that, uh, you know, the scripture makes it very clear that the prisoners heard them, you know, they, they knew what was, uh, what was going on, what was uh, taking place. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were loosed. And so here's a, uh, you know, God working in a tremendous, uh, tremendous way in Philippi that this, uh, earthquake takes place, uh, you know, everybody's bonds uh, fall off, the doors are open, and, you know, everybody's, you know, ready to, you know, they can run out the, the door, and they can escape, and here's God, you know, making this, uh, this way of deliverance for the, uh, for the Apostle Paul, for Silas to get out of this, uh, this horrible situation that they're in. Verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out the sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners have been all have all been fled. And so here's the, you know, the one who is the keeper of the prison saying, wow, I'm in trouble now because all of these people have escaped. That's my job to keep them in the prison. And I might as well just go ahead and kill myself because I'm going to be killed because I haven't uh, done the job that I'm supposed to, uh, to do. And so he grabs his sword and he's really ready to, uh, to kill himself. Verse uh, 28 it says, but call, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. And I always uh, wondered as uh, how Paul knew that uh, the jailer was, uh, you know, the, the warden, the prison, the one who was in charge. How did he know that uh, this was taking place? You know, did God reveal that to him or is, uh, the setting so that they'd be able to, uh, to see it? Uh, I have been into a couple of old uh, prisons, one down in uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, it was just a, a big tunnel that you just went back in the only way in and the only way out was that, uh, you know, door that was open there. And so maybe it was a similar kind of thing that there was just one room and on the other side of the bars or the wall or whatever was where the, uh, 
guy who guarded the prison was and and Paul was able to see what's taking place I just always thought that that was interesting that Paul knew that but he he cried with a loud voice saying uh, do thyself no harm for we're all here nobody has escaped you know we're all uh, we're all still here verse 29 he says then he called for light and sprang in and came trembling and he fell down before Paul and Silas now isn't it interesting that uh, he would choose Paul and Silas as the ones to fall down in front of uh, because probably he had heard the singing and praising of, uh, of God, and he recognized that God was, uh, you know, doing a tremendous work in the midst of, uh, of this uh, uh, prison situation that he's, uh, you know, delivering, uh, delivering these men. And so uh, they come, he comes in, and he fell down before Paul and Silas, and he said, verse 30 says, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, what do I what do I need to do to have everlasting life? What do I need to to do to be, uh, you know, to have whatever it is that you uh, that you have? And, you know, all of us who uh, like to share the gospel with people, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, the, like the sweetest words that you ever hear when somebody says to you, uh, how, how can I be saved? How can I have everlasting life? How can I how can I be born uh, born again? And so uh, Paul says, uh, you know, he explains the, to him, uh, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You know, that's what you need to do. You need to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to, to uh, uh, believe on him, not just a belief that he exists, but, you know, actually put the, uh, the weight of your salvation upon the, the shoulders, upon the, uh, the life, upon the body of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can have, uh, you can have everlasting life. And so uh, he takes uh, the Apostle Paul home and, and uh, feeds him and takes care of his uh, wounds and does all of those, uh, those things to him. And so we see that, you know, there's the beginning of the, the church in, uh, in Philippi with uh, Lydia. Uh, we're not sure if the, the maiden who had the demon, whether she got uh, we have the Philippian jailer, and I'm sure that there are many other people that were part of the jail situation, maybe that were there that night that, that knew the things that were going on. But that was the beginning of the, of the church in, uh, in Philippi. Now, let's jump over, if you would, to the book of Philippians. And this morning, what we want to do, with, do is just look at the first, uh, first couple of verses of the, uh, of the book of Philippians and uh, <clears throat> chapter 1. And it says this, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, <clears throat> Paul and Timothy uh, were the ones that were together at the writing of this, uh, of this book. And Paul and Timothy, what was their position in life? Well, their position in life is they were the, the servants of Jesus Christ. Just like uh, you and I, we are the servants of, uh, of Jesus Christ. That's our, our position. That's our occupation. That's our, our calling uh, to, uh, to serve God with the, the gifts, the abilities, the talents that he has given to us. That's who he wants us to, uh, to be, servants of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, and Paul says, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, he's writing to all the saints. And we know when he's talking about saints, in a biblical uh, definition of saints, it was uh, anybody who has put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so uh, he's writing to all the folks in Philippi. Uh, telling them, encouraging them that, uh, you know, you are saints, you are, uh, you know, the called out ones in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also writes to the, who are at Philippi, he also writes to the bishops and the deacons, the overseers would be the pastors of the different, uh, you know, house churches that would be around in the, in the city of Philippi, uh, the deacons who are, who are serving at those, uh, those different, uh, different churches. And then he makes this interesting uh, statement, and most people look at this and say, well, you know, he's, he's, you know, sort of a standard greeting kind of thing, which you see in other places in the, uh, in the scripture. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this, the, the, the way that he encourages them or the beginning of his encouragement to them to, to grow in the faith and to walk with, uh, with God starts with the, the very introduction of the, uh, of the scripture. And he says, grace 
unto you. Now, uh, the title of my message, uh, you didn't see this because you probably didn't get a, you didn't get a bulletin because we didn't have church, but the title of uh, my message this morning is something that we all need. And that thing that we all need is we all need God's grace. Okay. God's grace is God giving us something that we don't earn, something that we don't deserve. God giving us something that uh, he graciously wants to provide to, to us as a, uh, as a present. Now, let's turn over, if you would, to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 5, and let's talk about this idea of grace. What are we, uh, what are we referring to? And uh, whenever you're studying theology... One of the things that uh, you do when you're studying grace is you see that there are two different kinds of grace that are talked about in the, uh, in the scriptures. And the one is what we call common grace or general grace. It's the grace that is on people that are saved and people that are unsaved. In uh, Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 5, let's start reading at verse uh, 43. It says, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes a sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you uh, love them who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that. And I want you to notice in verse, uh, verse 45, what does he say? What does God do? God makes the sun to, to rise on the evil and on the good both. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. And so we call this, you know, God's common grace that God gives us this, uh, uh, you know, the, the blessings of life. And it's not just the idea that, uh, you know, saved people and unsaved people both get rain and they both get sunshine. But you think about all the other things that God graciously allows us to have, whether we are uh, saved or whether we're unsaved. You know, you think about the laws of, uh, of nature that we, uh, that we live under. You know, they're a blessing to the saved people, a blessing to the unsaved people. You think about the, the weather. You think about the uh, uh, planting and harvesting. You think of uh, uh, the functioning of our, our, of our physical bodies. You think about uh, the ability to, uh, to have children. You think about being married. You think about working. You think about, uh, you know, the list just goes on and on of all the things that we're, we as saved or unsaved people are capable of doing. Why? Because God graciously allows us to, uh, to do that. God graciously gives us the the opportunity to do that and so when we're talking about grace we're talking about grace that not only is for people that are saved and we're going to talk about that in just a moment but whenever we're talking about grace we're talking about god's grace is available and god's grace is used and understood and and usually taken for granted by uh all the people in the world you know how many unsaved people wake up in the morning and say you know thank you god for a new day that I have to uh, today. Thank you, God, for the for the sunshine. They they just don't do that, but they those things come because God is gracious to them. God is gracious to you and I to have those uh, those kinds of things. So we have this thing that we call common grace, but then we also have this thing that we call uh, special grace or uh, uh, special working of God's grace. Over in uh, the book of Ephesians, let's jump over there if you would. Ephesians chapter uh, chapter two, again a very familiar verse. I hope you have this in your uh, in your memory banks to be able to uh, to share with uh, with people. But in Ephesians chapter uh, chapter two, verses eight and nine, it says, "For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast." And probably the uh, the best illustration, the best demonstration of the uh, grace of God is in the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, give you and I. Uh, he came to this earth to die on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the, from the dead so that everyone who puts their faith and trust in him could have this wonderful thing called salvation. And again, as the, the verse clearly said, it's not by works that we have done, 
Uh, God doesn't want us to get up into heaven and say, you know, God, look how good I was. Look at all the work I have done. Look how I have, uh, uh, you know, been a good person. He wants us to get up into heaven and say, you know, thank you, God, for your grace, for giving me this, this free gift of everlasting life. It's not something I can earn or I can deserve, nothing that I can uh, do of my own merits to, uh, to get this, this, uh, this gift of salvation. But God, thank you for, uh, you know, for giving me this, uh, this grace. And so one of the types of uh, special grace is the idea of salvation. And hopefully uh, every morning you are thankful to, uh, to God for this special grace, this wonderful salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided for you, has provided for me, all of us who have put our faith and trust in, uh, in him. Now, there's another type of uh, special grace. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans, chapter 12. God gives us uh, another type of, uh, type of grace. In Romans, chapter 12, uh, you remember this is one of the passages that talk about the uh, spiritual gifts. He says, uh, in Romans, chapter 12, and verse 6, he says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith, or ministry, let us minister as he teaches on teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, lest him, uh, let him do it with liberality, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And so these, these gifts that uh, God gives us, we call them you know, spiritual gifts, that God has given to us, and he has given us these spiritual gifts so that we can do what? So that we have the opportunity to serve him with these gifts that we have, you know, whether it be prophesying, whether it be uh, teaching, whether it be giving, whether it be administration, whatever, you know, whatever uh, encouragement, all of those, uh, all those gifts are not because, you know, we are, we are good, or we are wonderful, or uh, we have these, you know, special talents, because we are, you know, just awesome people. It's God giving us these, these gifts, these abilities, so that we can use them to build up this, this wonderful thing that he calls the body of Christ. And so not only God, does God save us, but God has also given us, you know, these talents, skills, and abilities, so that we're able to serve him, we're able to, uh, uh, worship him with these gifts that he has given to us. And so uh, many times, you know, you hear people uh, talk about, well, you know, I, I can worship God. I got saved and, and I like to go out into the wilderness and I like to, you know, to worship God there and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, which is great, you know, it's nothing wrong with going out in the wilderness and worshiping God, but God has also given everybody who is a believer, a grace gift to use and that is used in this thing called the body of Christ, in the church of Jesus Christ. So whenever you divorce yourself from the, from the church, uh, you don't use those gifts and talents in the church of Jesus Christ, then the, the church is, is lacking in things that God has provided and things that God wants to be, uh, to be used. So God gives us his special grace for salvation. He gives us his special grace for, uh, for service. Turn over to, uh, if you would, the book of... Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 12, and one other uh, type of grace that, uh, that God gives us, a special kind of grace, and there's probably other ones that I'm, uh, that I'm missing as, uh, as we think about these, uh, these things, but in, uh, in the book of uh, Second Corinthians, we see that uh, the Apostle Paul has a, uh, a problem. He has a, uh, an issue with uh, something physical that's going on with, uh, with him. And uh, he says in verse number, uh, uh, let's start reading at verse number seven. He says in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, seven, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there were given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. I think it's interesting that Paul you know, recognizes this special place that he is in and God's revelation that he has, uh, he has given to, uh, to him. And he's thankful to God for giving him this, uh, this revelation, this blessing that he has provided for him. But he said, uh, you know, that uh, God is the one who, gave him, who has given him this thorn in, uh, in the flesh. And so verse eight says, he says, for this thing, I have besought the Lord three times 
that it might depart from me. You know, he asked God, you know, God, take this away, please. God, take this away, please. God, take this away, please. And verse nine says, and he said unto me, now here's direct revelation from the, from the Lord himself. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, so what's Paul saying here? Paul, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. My uh, helping hand, my uh, encouragement, my strengthening to go through difficult situations. He said, that's sufficient for you. That's, a, that's enough for you to be able to, uh, to get through these, these difficulties, these trials, these struggles that, uh, that are going on in your, in your life. He says, my grace is sufficient. And, and you know, many times uh, we have seen people uh, through the years who have gone through, you know, just horrible physical things or family things or emotional things or, you know, just things. And, and people stand back and say, I don't know how they make it through those difficulties. I don't know how they make it through those struggles. I don't know how they make it through that. And the answer is this, God gives them the grace to do it. Okay. You know, we don't get the grace to do it unless we have the struggle, the difficulty, the trial, the problem to go through. But whenever that trial, that problem, that difficulty steps uh, into our lives, it's a part of us. We know that God's grace is going to be there to strengthen us, to help us, to get us through this, uh, you know, this struggle, whether it's to take us to glory, uh, to be with him forever, or whether it's, uh, you know, to stay here on this earth and, and go through this trial, this difficulty, whatever it is, either way, God's grace is going to be sufficient. God's grace is going to take care of us. God giving us what we need in each particular situation, and we can rest assured of that. We can, you know, we can be encouraged by that and, and recognize when things come into our lives and we have these uh, struggles that are happening, you know, God's grace is going to be right there to take care of us. Now, let's go back, if you would, to the book of uh, Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. So Paul and Timothy, they're writing to the saints and the bishops and the deacons at, uh, at Philippi, and he says, uh, grace be unto you, and then he says, peace. And he says, peace. Now, interesting, uh, peace is uh, what the world says peace is an absence of war, an absence of fighting, an absence of problems, an absence of difficulties, an absence of anxiety, an absence of struggle, you know, that that's what peace is. But we all know that we live in a, a world that is not going to have peace until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, comes back for the second time. And so uh, Jesus said that, uh, you know, while we live here on this earth, we can have peace, that peace personal peace that we have inside of our uh, ourself. Peace comes from, first of all, that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because whenever we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when we ask him to be our savior, there's no more enmity. There's no more fighting. We're not an enemy of God anymore. We are now in the family of God. We have been adopted and we have been born into the family of God, that the spirit of God lives inside of us. And so, you know, that's uh, the beginning of this, uh, this peace that God has. And peace only comes, you know, once we have gotten saved. And then it's interesting if we jump back over to uh, Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter, uh, chapter four, that God wants you and I as believers to have peace in our, you know, in our inner man. Okay. Philippians chapter uh, four, notice what he says in verse six, again, very familiar verses, but it talks about this, this peace that God wants us to have. He says, be anxious or be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then notice what he says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Now, that's a beautiful thing to say for a preacher, because you don't have to explain what it means, because you don't understand it either. Okay, God understands, God knows how this, uh, this peace comes, but God gives us this peace, okay? Whenever we quit uh, focusing on the problems, the difficulties, we begin to, uh, to pray about these things, 
We're not anxious for them or anymore. He says, the, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, okay? And you can do that in the midst of a, you know, turmoil. You can do that in the midst of struggle. You can do that in the midst of war. You can have that peace of God because you know what? You know that God has you in the palm of his hand. You know, God is, is looking after you. God is taking care of you. God is going to provide for you. God is going to, uh, you know, uh, when the world ends, he's going to, uh, to take you home or at your death or at the rapture of the church. God is going to, uh, God is going to take you home. And you have that, that peace that, you know, you know how things are going to end and uh, the Lord's hand is going to be upon you. Then verse eight, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me uh, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And I thought it's interesting that, uh, what does he call him? He says, the God of peace shall be with you, okay, and just think about that for a second when you go back to the old testament and see all the uh the different things that uh that god did and you know this uh uh taking down nations and you know people that were killed and all those kind of things but he's still called the god of peace because the god of peace gives us peace right here in our in our hearts and so when we think about this uh we think about this passage of scripture the book of philippians the apostle paul starts out by saying what he says, I want you to have grace and peace, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are the only ones that are able to provide peace for us. And I don't know where you are today. I know that, uh, you know, Don mentioned uh, a lot of things that are going on with people, a lot of struggles that are taking place. Uh, you know, sickness, we're in the midst of this whole COVID thing that doesn't seem to ever, uh, ever want to, uh, to go away. And we need to recognize that, you know, God's grace is there, okay, sufficient in every situation for our, our salvation and our giftedness and our, our difficulties that we have in life, you know, God's grace is there with us. And so since we have the grace of God, God says, you know, don't worry about those things, abide in my peace, rest in my peace. And so this morning, if you never put your faith in trust, I don't know everybody who's on the, uh, on the list here uh, today, but if you uh, never put your faith and trust in the, the Lord Jesus, you know, grasp hold of that grace, call out to God and say, God, I, I want to I wanna receive that gift of everlasting life. I want to have that salvation that you, only, you can give. And then I want to have that peace. And maybe you are a believer and, and you're struggling with that peace you know, go back to uh, Philippians chapter four and, and read through that and pray through that and, and think about the fact that, you know, do I, do I have anxieties? Do I'm, am I anxious about things? Am I, am I worried about what's taking place? You know, God, I need to, you know, cast my cares upon you so that I can have that only that peace that you can give because there's just so much grace. You know, the grace of God is abundant. The peace of God is abundant. It's not that there's not enough to go around. It's us allocating that to ourselves and not being caught up in all of the things that are going on in the world. Let's pray together. Our wonderful God, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to uh, think about how you have blessed us in so, so, so many ways. We think of this, uh, the common grace that everyone in the world has. We pray that uh, there would be some people that would turn to Jesus because they recognize this, the, the life that they live, the, the beating of their heart, uh, with everything that they have in life comes from you. And God, for all of us that are saved, God, help us to, to just enjoy this grace that you have given us. Help us to... Uh, glory in it help us to take comfort in the fact that no matter what takes place in life that you're going to be there and your graciousness is going to be there with us too and we ask heavenly father that you would uh, help us to understand that peace and if there's someone here lord that's uh, listening to this message they've never put their faith and trust in the, the living god jesus as their savior i pray that they would uh, call out to god and ask him to save him give him that new life that only jesus can give and we give you praise and we give you thanks for all that you've done. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name.
Amen.